So thank you again for joining us. Just to give you a sense of the run of show, we'll begin momentarily with speakers' remarks from both Ocha and Echo, and then move into a moderated panel discussion. As mentioned earlier, we encourage everyone in the audience to submit any questions you have through the Q&A function. You should see this at the bottom of your screens in Zoom, and we'll be monitoring that throughout the chat so that we can address as many questions as are submitted. If you have general comments, you can feel free to submit those to the chat, but we'll be mainly monitoring the Q&A throughout the discussion. It's my pleasure to begin by inviting Ramesh Rajasingham, the Acting Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator from the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs to offer some opening remarks. Ramesh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Stuart, and it's a huge honor for me to join Juha in this, uh, in this meeting. Thank you uh, all for, uh, very much for joining us today for this event on data responsibility and humanitarian action. And I'm pleased to open this session and welcome you all to what promises to be a very rich discussion on a hugely important topic that increases in importance each year, especially uh, following the COVID crisis. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize our partners from DG ECHO who have supported Archer's work on data responsibility over the last two years. Together, we have worked to move from a high level principles and policy frameworks to practical guidance, tools and processes that can help humanitarians navigate an increasingly complex area of work. And your strategic vision and partnership has been fundamental to progress in this area across the humanitarian system. And we are enormously grateful for DG ECHO's leadership on this issue. Data responsibility in humanitarian action is the safe, ethical, and effective management of data for operational response. It is a critical issue for the humanitarian system to address, and the stakes are indeed very high. In 2021, 235 million people worldwide will need humanitarian assistance and protection, an increase of 40% in just one year. Just as COVID-19 has exacerbated existing humanitarian emergencies, it has also increased the sector's reliance on digital technologies and data. More than ever before, data is essential to our work as a system. Humanitarians must be careful, however, when handling data to avoid placing already vulnerable people at greater risk. For example, disclosing the location or particular identity or affiliation of an individual or community could expose them to targeted violence, social exclusion, or other forms of harm as well. In addition to avoiding harm, the safe, ethical, and effective management of data also has a number of benefits. It can lead to more informed and transparent decision-making, more efficient humanitarian response, and, increasing, and increased trust among humanitarian actors and with people who, who we seek to serve. We have made considerable progress as a system in advancing data responsibility in recent years. However, the gaps remain uh, between global frameworks for data responsibility and their practical application in humanitarian settings. Because the humanitarian data ecosystem is inherently interconnected, no individual organization can tackle these challenges alone. While each organization is responsible for its own data, Humanitarians need system-wide guidance to inform individual and collective action and uphold a high standard for data responsibility in different operating environments. In view of this, Archer supported the establishment of a subgroup on data responsibility under the Interagency Standing Committee, IASC, in January of this year to develop joint system-wide operational guidance on data responsibility in humanitarian action. The subgroup has been led by, co-led by the International Organization for Migration, IOM, the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and comprises 20 member organizations representing different stakeholders from across the humanitarian system. The operational guidance aims to consolidate the current policies and practice, practices of humanitarian partners in the area of data responsibility. This includes agreeing on common frameworks for information and data sensitivity in classification, data incident management, 
and practices to reduce the risk of sensitive data before sharing it, among other key topics. The operational guidance is now in the final stage of review, and I look forward to seeing how the sector collectively advances this critical work. OCHA will continue to support the development of practical guidance, provide technical advisory support to OCHA and partners on the adoption of responsible data practices, prototype technical tools for the management of sensitive data, and convene partners across the humanitarian system for discussions like this one. Once again, thank you to Juha for, and, and DG uh, Echo for your catalytic support uh, to this work over the past two years. In addition to the concrete results of our collaboration, your foundational investment has mobilized additional support from other donor states and humanitarian organizations for this critical area of work. Notably, the Humanitarian Data and Trust Initiative, launched earlier this year by the government of Switzerland, the ICRC and OCHA, will, and this will serve as an important platform for accelerating collective action on data responsibility. So it is now my extreme pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Juha Ovinen, Deputy Director from DG Echo, to deliver his opening remarks. Juha, thank you very much and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Ramesh. Um, thank you all also for the kind words and, and, and it has been a pleasure to, to cooperate with you on this, uh, on this important uh, initiative and on, on this important topic in, in general. Um, I would like to thank also, uh, also you and Ocha and my colleagues in ECHO for, for organizing this, uh, this important event. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to echo many, many points uh, raised by, by Ramesh. Um, humanitarian organizations are collecting, storing and sharing more data than ever before. Um, and um, as with the rest of society, this trend is only expected to grow as more and and we continue to, as, as, we, as we continue to make use of digital tools um, uh, more and more. So there's a data revolution going on and uh, how humanitarians respond to this data revolution will be a key factor in determining our effectiveness in the coming years. Um, so we must aim to harness the benefits of more and better data to make us more efficient and, and effective improving our response and ultimately improving the lives of our beneficiaries. At the same time, we cannot give a blank check to digital. We must be acutely aware of the risks to affected populations that mishandled data can pose and ensure that we continue to do no digital harm. It should come as no surprise that uh, as a humanitarian donor, uh, DG Echo um, views the responsible collection, use and safe sharing of data as being fundamental to harnessing the benefits of digital technologies for humanitarian response. And um, that's why we are extremely pleased to have been working with the, with the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data over the last two years to support safer sharing of data over the Humanitarian Data Exchange, the HDX platform, and to work towards sectorial guidance on best practice in data responsibility. Our hope is that uh, this project, which is the backdrop to today's event, will lead to better and safer data, data sharing amongst humanitarians and an enhanced awareness of data protection risks. But not only that, we also hope that uh, it will lead to new strategies for mitigating these data protection risks. As this uh, project draws to a close, um, we hope to share the lessons learned amongst practitioners so that uh, together as a sector, we can build on the good work done here. Our preoccupation moving forward um, is to address how we move from global standards on data protection. One of the examples, uh, the, the principles of the EU's own general data protection uh, regulation. 
from our own contractual rules on data protection on humanitarian actions, from the work of the ICRC on the handbook on data protection and humanitarian action, or the work of our colleagues at OCHA on data responsibility guidelines. So how do we move from this to concrete implementation on the ground? In short, how do we ensure data responsibility filters through, filters through from the center to all projects involving potentially sensitive data? The practical guidance provided by the OCHA Center on Humanitarian Data as part of this project is a first step in that direction. The discussion that will be the main part of today's event, and, and which I'm pleased to say features experts in this field, should help us identify the challenges that remain to be met and move us, move us towards concrete solutions for realizing responsibility, data responsibility in practice. Uh, therefore, therefore, without further ado, I hand over to the moderator for the discussion, uh, Mr. Stuart Campo from the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data. Um, we in DG Echo look forward to a lively and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juha, for those remarks. And thank you as well to Ramesh for getting us set here for what will be, I think, quite a heated discussion amongst our expert panel. I'll invite our experts to turn their cameras on so that everyone can see you as I make some introductions. So I'm really pleased today to be joined by four colleagues who represent different corners of the humanitarian system, all approaching issues of data responsibility in their day-to-day -day work. We have, as you hopefully can soon see on the screen, Ms. Irina Konevali, who is the Chief of the Norms and Standards Section from the Global Data Service at UNHCR, Nina Das, the Head of Research for Impact or Reach, Shannon O'Hara, who's a Humanitarian Affairs Officer with OJ Yemen, and Massimo Marelli, the Head of the Data Protection Office at the ICRC. Colleagues, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. So, as a quick reminder for the audience, I saw Kareem, my colleague, dropped a message into the chat, but we welcome you to submit questions through the Q&A function throughout this discussion. We'll begin for roughly the next 20 to 25 minutes with two rounds of structured questions, and then we'll really open the floor. So really looking to get audience engagement throughout, feel free to direct questions to specific experts or pose a general question that we can then tackle together. So I'd like to begin with a bit of a provocation about the degree to which we have learned lessons from our experience, not just this year, which has been, as everyone has consistently said, a unique and particular year, but really over a, a quite um, longer horizon of the past 10 years of humanitarian technology and data, where you can argue that this has really become one of the key themes of how we do what we do as a sector. Last week at the Global Humanitarian Policy Forum, one of the speakers mentioned that there are many lessons on the table, but few lessons learned. And while he was referring specifically to epidemic response, I would argue that that actually is a disorder more acutely seen in the humanitarian technology space. So to begin, I'd like to ask our experts to help us dispel this perception that we're not learning lessons and reflect a bit on what has changed, positively or negatively, but hopefully mostly positively, in how we've approached data responsibility in our work as a sector. To begin, Nina, I'll welcome you to reflect on this and just share from your experience at Impact and Reach what's changed for the way that you all handle data and more specifically navigate challenges around data responsibility in your work. Great, thank you, Stuart. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm sure you all have very busy end of year schedules. So um, I think from our experience at Impact uh, and specifically with REACH, we, we have seen some changes, but not so much necessarily with, with the engagement with data. Of course, REACH uh, has been around for almost 10 years now. This is something we've been, we've been doing. I think the one, one concrete change that we notice is just how much demand there is for, for direct data access um, over the past few years. And practically this, this implies a few things for, for data responsibility. And I think positive learnings, if I may, um, that I've noticed at least. So the first one we see is as REACH, I mean, uh, again, as I said, our organizational mission has been to make data widely available, um, 
transparently but in a protected way as uh, as much as possible on our on, on on our online platforms but we have now more and more the need to reach a wider audience we have requests from different partners to to make our data available on multiple different platforms and i think this has given us an opportunity to kind of learn from one another from our partners to kind of see how our internal organizational policies, our internal organizational SOPs align with what others are doing, what can we learn from each other in, in, in a positive way. And one concrete example, obviously, is our, is our partnership with HDX um, on, on SDC tool and internalizing that into, into our processes as well. I think the second implication of this direct, as partners more and more directly engage with, with data that we produce specifically, is um, the role of microdata. So we have we collect hundreds and thousands of surveys. Each of them have uh, a lot of metadata that we would use for our internal processing, but maybe not make it widely available for, for a lot of different reasons. But now as partners want to directly engage with data sets, they want to run their own analysis and see outputs that maybe we don't produce in our, in our information products. We have to kind of balance a bit the, the need to retain analytical value of the data set while also ensuring that we share data in a very responsible way. And I think this, this is something that, that's fairly new, fairly recent. We have a lot of requests coming in to say, okay, we would like to run analysis with XYZ variables. We wouldn't make that available in a public, uh, publicly available data set. So how can we make sure that this uh, nuance needs analysis that you need for decision-making is still possible without um, kind of breaching uh, our own internal requirements and SOPs on, on data sharing? So I think these, I would say, just to start off, two very uh, practical um, implications I have seen, but again, I do think uh, in, in a positive, uh, positive way. So I'll stop there and I'll keen to hear what the other panelists have to say. Thanks so much, Nina. That's a really great start. And I think also a good link to passing across to Shannon uh, in the OJ Yemen office, who of course is dealing quite regularly with demands for data and also figuring out how best to de-risk data before sharing it with the people that need it most. Shannon, over to you. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity and good evening, colleagues. I would say that the, the major change we've seen from a field perspective, and to really reiterate one of the key points raised by Ramesh in his opening remarks, has been the shift of data responsibility from a policy level discussion centered in New York or Geneva to practical guidance and support that's provided to the field. From an OCHA perspective, information sharing is one of the most basic activities of coordination. We work with data in all types of formats every single day, but it's how, when, and why we share information that determines the quality of the humanitarian response, and more importantly, how it affects the lives of the most vulnerable populations. So based on my experience in both Syria and Yemen, we've seen a major shift towards collective ownership of data responsibility. And this is most visible through the adoption of information sharing protocols at country level. These protocols mark a significant shift in approach for two key reasons. The first is there's a clear recognition that data is absolutely essential to our daily work and that there must be clear protocols in place to manage it. And second, data management is the collective responsibility of everyone in the humanitarian system. So looking back, before the introduction of the information sharing protocols, in most cases, data sets and information were shared based on relationships and personal connections to people or organizations. There were no hard or fast rules in place and often little to no guidance on what types of information could be shared with who and at what levels. In the case of Syria, the development of the protocols really helped to systematize data sharing and fostered a transparent environment. Partners are more comfortable to share information when there are clear guidelines in place that spell out what is sensitive and what is not. Essentially on the ground, that translated into partners knowing that individuals' personal information would not be misused or misshared, and at the same time also understanding how it would be used to inform decision-making. In Yemen, we've also seen a shift towards more responsible data collection practices, 
So for the past several months, we've been working on the implementation of the MCLA or the multi-cluster location assessment, which would be the first countrywide household level multi-cluster assessment in Yemen. It's a big exercise uh, with thousands of enumerators deployed across the country over a six week period to conduct interviews with households from urban centers to remote mountain villages. But because of the scale of the exercise and especially the particular challenges we face in Yemen, we're working closely with the Center for Humanitarian Data to unpack key data responsibility issues related to data collection, storage, security, sharing, retention, and destruction to ensure that the assessment is in line with humanitarian principles and more importantly, that we protect participants throughout the process. So Yemen continues to be one of the most challenging operating environments in the world. And the MCLA is a clear test case for the implementation of principled and neutral assessments. But this type of work is only possible because of the shift in collective commitment to more responsible data practices in the sector. So Stuart, those are, those are my thoughts, but very much looking forward to what the other participants have to say. Over. Brilliant, Shannon, thank you so much. And I think it's really helpful early in the conversation to get this reality of the field in, in two of arguably the most complex environments where humanitarians are responding right now. So thank you for those thoughts and glad to hear that some of these maybe seemingly dry uh, but important interventions like protocols on how we share data are being put to good use in the field. Much of the work that's been done in this area has drawn on the richer area of data protection in humanitarian action, specifically around personal data protection that the ICRC has been leading on. So Massimo, I'll turn next to you to hear some of your reflections on how this space has evolved over the past few years and maybe one thing that's really changed for you as an organization. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to be here and discuss uh, a, a topic that is so important for, for us and that can have really a very important impact uh, on the ground in the deployment of responsible technology. So I would uh, really um, concur and agree with uh, what Shannon has just been uh, describing as a, as a change in the awareness and uh, the, 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 the consciousness of the sector around the importance of getting it right, the risks involved within getting it wrong, and uh, an awareness of how to navigate this very complex, um, the very complex field. We have uh, over uh, the past couple of years been developing a number of tools that are really uh, useful to enable this navigation of a complex environment. And uh, I think if we're looking at what has changed, uh, this really changed the scenario dramatically. Uh, we were uh, previously kind of stuck in a in an environment that was uh, yeah stuck between two evils, either the experimentation uh, side of things where, you know, the mantra of testing and failing that works very well uh, if you're reading a, a business management magazine in an airport lobby, but in a humanitarian setting doesn't necessarily always work exactly uh, smoothly, particularly if you're uh, working with data of very vulnerable populations uh, and uh, their life, death and dignity could be at stake. Um, and on the other hand, the awareness of the fact that there may be some risks and not really knowing what those risks are nor how to deal with them uh, kind of paralyzes the sector and uh, therefore prevents and stops people from using technologies that could actually be so important in tackling some of the new challenges that the humanitarian sector is facing. So uh, it is actually in response to this current, uh, to, 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 that, uh, to that situation that, uh, uh, we see all the great work that you guys have been doing from the Center of Humanitarian Data, uh, the work that we have been doing together in the handbook uh, process and um, and the tip sheets that followed in uh, to provide a little bit more concrete uh, application in the um, in relation to specific factors to actually provide a perhaps a, a third way and a third way that is more um, responsible and that gives us the possibility to uh, properly test and deploy new technologies. So, the, as as you know, the handbook is a is a tool that we 
have been working on for a while and uh, it's now come to the second edition. It has a, um, a general section that looks at the application of the fundamental principles of data protection um, contextualized in the very extreme uh, settings of humanitarian action and then tries to uh, decline it and, and apply it in uh, the deployment, in the responsible deployment of a whole range of different technologies from AI, machine learning, big data, cloud, um, uh, UAV drones, blockchain, uh, digital identity and biometrics, um, and so on. So I think really what has been uh, developing over the last couple of years is the third way, this, this third way. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Massimo. I, I like the notion of us emerging from between two evils toward this more responsible third way. I think that's a, a good way to summarize where we're at as a sector. I think what's also really interesting, and we'll hear next from Irina, is to think about the different actors in the system and, and how we experience these challenges and opportunities in different ways. So as a global organization managing some of the most sensitive but important data in the system, Irina. What's one development that's been critical in your view uh, from UNHCR's perspective over the past few years? Thank you very much, Stuart, and very happy to be with all of you today. It's really a pleasure and an honor to, uh, to have this panel. Um, I, before I go to UNHCR, first of all, I would like to echo um, all the panelists because we, we are of the same opinion that it's important to design and follow data sharing protocols. It's important to pay attention to all the data that we collect and process. And of course, it is not least important, if not more important, to ensure the data that we collect is made available for decision making. So the one thing that I would like to, to uh, put to the, to the fore of today's discussion is the other side of data or the other side of partners, the, the interface between humanitarian and development work. And I think one of the takeaway for me um, in the last couple of years is that our collaboration with development partners has definitely increased, enhanced, and data has been the bridge between that, the two worlds that we usually associate ourselves with between humanitarian and development world. Um, and maybe I can bring two, uh, two cases or two examples to illustrate that, uh, that stronger collaboration. With um, UNHCR, we have recently um, expanded our collaboration with the World Bank and have set up a joint uh, data center for uh, forced displacement. This is precisely the, the place that we believe should ensure um, making data more available in a responsible way for research, for decision making, for policy makers, where data that is so critical um, is being made available, but it's also understood. So it follows the proper protocols on, on, um, pro on, on um, documenting, on recording, on sharing, and this is very important. Um, also as a result, or if I would like to again make that link between um, humanitarian and development spheres, is the importance of sharing data for research. And what I have noticed, um, probably in the last two, three years, I've seen hundreds of uh, data sharing agreements with academia, with other research entities that um, explore and research the different um, uh, contexts of refugees and other displaced populations. And that's important because as a result of that, what we want to do is to better protect, to better solve the situations, and of course, to include um, our persons of concern into the national systems. Um, that, that's one case of where I would like to talk about the development partners and our engagement, but also what I've seen that for UNHCR, this time has been really transformative. Um, in the last two years, UNHCR has, um, has issued a, a global data transformation strategy for the entire organization with a vision articulating its, um, um, uh, the importance of placing refugees at the core of any data activities. The activities that will protect, um, solve, and of course, assist our persons of concern. Also, as part of the transformation, we have established a global data service 
um, and enhanced our data governance. Again, going back to the discussions that um, that uh, panelists have, uh, or the the statements that panelists put forward, what is important is that we know who does what with data in the organization and how we share the data. So governance is important, and of course, as a result of that, um, I have seen um, more collaboration um, with the partners. Um, less territoriality and definitely putting the beneficiaries at the core of all of our activities. And in the end, I think what I can say is uh, we can we can um, enhance our um, data activities. We can make our data uh, more open, and this openness needs to be done in a very responsible way. Um, thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Irina. I think that first round really gives us a sense of how far we've come and the progress we've made. There is greater and more intentional demand for data in the sector and also a recognition of the interconnectedness, not just within the humanitarian space, but with our colleagues on the side of development. There is this more sort of responsible and intentional third way, as Massimo put it, that includes measures like what Shannon and Nina described in terms of how we actually practically manage data and share it in a concrete and predictable way with each other so that we can use it effectively to assist populations in need. Now, in the spirit of being at the end of the year, I wanna look forward and think about what challenges and opportunities are really driving how we think about data responsibility moving into 2021. For this, Shannon, I'll turn back to you to get us started. What's one challenge or opportunity in the context of your work with OCHA that really is top of mind in this area? Thanks, Stuart. I think uh, the biggest challenge I see in the year ahead is a very practical one. It's the general misconception within country offices that data management is the sole responsibility of IM teams. I think this siloed view has really narrowed the discussions to technical levels. I am not an information management officer. My work is focused on intersector coordination. I work with people, not spreadsheets. Well, sometimes spreadsheets. But nevertheless, I still engage with sensitive data every day. And even more so during the current HNO HRP season, it's, it's a key element of our work. Information and data are, are critical to what we do, but too often we're not held accountable for how it's used and how it's disseminated. Information sharing is one of the most basic activities of coordination. We need to acknowledge that within the humanitarian system, data responsibility is everyone's job. And if we can facilitate safer and more principled information sharing by acknowledging and accepting this collective responsibility, it can lead to informed and transparent decision-making, more effective humanitarian response, and increased trust among humanitarian actors. Looking at this challenge as an opportunity, in the year ahead, we have the chance to enhance implementation of the global frameworks at field level. And now in, in May of 2019, I attended the Wilton Park event on data responsibility, which brought together experts and field practitioners from across the world. While there was a common understanding among participants, the gaps between HQ and the field on how data responsibility works in practice were evident. But the key to closing these gaps is simple. It's increasing awareness about data responsibility at all levels. Across the board, from HC level to enumerators collecting data in the field, the message is that we all have a role in ensuring data responsibility. From my personal perspective, I see my role as a humanitarian affairs officer working on intersector coordination to be threefold. The first is understanding how data is shared within the context I'm working in. The second is implementing the guidelines and protocols that are in place, and if there are none, working to get them set up. And then three, promoting global best practices within relevant coordination structures. Is this the case for all humanitarian staff? Are our roles in data responsibility clear? I don't think so. And this is where a lot of the misconception lies. I think it's important that we spell it out and hold ourselves accountable for it. 
What's really needed in practical terms is operational guidance that we can refer to outlining these roles and responsibilities. And as Ramesh referred to in his opening remarks, very much look forward to seeing the IASC operational guidance endorsed so that we can more clearly take up our respective roles and responsibilities in this area. So that's my, my, my view, Stuart, back over to you, thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Shannon. And I think the working with people, not spreadsheets, is probably common for many of us. And also the kind of secret, also sometimes spreadsheets that <laughs> you admitted. Irina, I'd like to come to you next and hear from UNHCR's perspective, what's one challenge or opportunity that's really driving your thinking around data responsibility heading into next year? Thank you, Stuart. And here I would like to probably build on what Shannon mentioned or has talked throughout. Um, I feel that the next for UNHCR, but not only, is probably to put the data responsibility through a different lenses or a different side um, and call it more freedom in the framework approach. Um, the, the times uh, this year has been the year that has transformed all of us. And um, I know I shouldn't be talking about the pandemic because we're already tired of talking about pandemic, but it has been an opportunity for, for everybody, including for the displaced, forcibly displaced persons. But we also have seen that freedom and that openness to data comes with risk. So bringing that framework, normative framework, is becoming even more important um, than in the past. Our entire exchange, our operations have become digital. We are having meetings digital, but we need to have those rules how we engage in the digital world. So for us to, uh, to remain and to uh, remain, um, um, and I would say not necessarily the forefront, but to meet the objectives of modernizing our approaches, improving our, our uh, responses, becoming more effective, we need to ensure that our normative frameworks are being put in place. And let me talk now about the operational guidance um, on data responsibility. Um, what I take away from this quite complex process that we have all been engaged throughout for this entire year and even before. What I see is this, this is the future for all of us. It's this normative framework that is not, does not only belong to one organization or the other, but the, the framework that sets um, commitments um, across the, across the uh, humanitarian world that links um, and can talk to the development um, sphere. Um, and I think that this is, this is the approach that will make us um, able to unify our definitions, taxonomies, ensure our data interoperability efforts, and this is the future. Um, I also believe through this, um, through this um, multi-partner approach, um, we will become less competitive and we will become more collaborative. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for me and the future where I'm looking really with <laughs> open eyes and, and, and um, being bright into the, the possibilities. Um, at the same time, if I look in into UNHCR and where do I see UNHCR in the year, the next year, um, and maybe a couple of years, is as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is focusing on the governance. Um, and with that, we have everything in place. Um, we have um, a global data service established last year and now properly, uh, properly, um, properly staffed, I would call this. Um, we have created ever in the humanitarian world, they understand a new section which is called norms and standard sections that will be specifically looking at the normative framework and will provide that freedom for all of us to, um, to um, collect, use, process uh, data and so on and so forth. Um, and um, UNHCR is definitely prioritizing the, the building of data culture uh, within the organization. As Shannon mentioned, um, we need to understand that data is not technical. I think we can no longer afford at any level to say that I don't understand what is microdata. I don't understand what is anonymization. I don't know what is risk disclosure. We cannot afford because our decision makers are taking decisions whether this data should be released, should become open or not. So I think that's, a, that's, that's some other changes that I would like to see in the organization. UNH said that usually has a reputation of protecting all the data that we have, but I think we can become much more responsible. We can be open and we can make this data available. Over from my side. Brilliant, Irina, thanks so much. And I think a lot of points that resonate there. Also, I imagine for Nina, given the nature of the work that her organization does. So Nina, over to you for one challenge or opportunity that is informing your planning as you head into 2021. 
Yes, thank you. I think, yeah, I will expand a bit already on something Irina has touched upon and Massimo before as well. So I think for us, the biggest kind of opportunity we see, but also challenge at the same time is, uh, is an innovation, innovation for data collection, innovation for data, data processing. And specifically as REACH, I mean, we, we work in some of like really highly operationally challenging contexts. So it, it, it has always been something we've been looking at quite conservatively, I think. But this year, obviously, um, brought an additional layer of complexity, but made us realize how much more we could be doing, how many more um, other opportunities are there, but how much uh, we have to think about things like data privacy, uh, secure data storage solutions, even for switching to simple um, digital remote data collection technologies. So I think this is something that, that we've started looking into this year and shown us that there is so much more we could be doing. But it's quite challenging when you're working in 25 different contexts, each with its own levels of complexities, um, to immediately say this, this innovation is exciting and we, we need to roll it out. I think that that is definitely something we would like to balance out and explore as an organization. Um, and something positive from, from earlier this year was just when we started looking at different opportunities, different possibilities for specifically for nuanced uh, remote data collection approaches. We were uh, quite amazed and a lot of, lot of um, information sharing between, between partners. So if somebody tried a specific approach in a specific country, they were very willing to share their lessons. And we were, um, a lot of our decisions on, okay, we can't do this for now is based on some learnings that we got through, you know, just one short Skype call with another partner organization. So I think that, uh, that definitely is, um, yeah, the challenge and opportunity in one. Thank you. Brilliant, Naina, thanks so much for that. Finally, Massimo, coming to you and just a quick reminder before, before I hand over to colleagues that there is this Q&A function, which is now quite active. We have 24 open questions. You can upvote the questions that you'd like us to tackle following Massimo's response to this question. So please do take a look at that and then we'll dive into the Q&A. So Massimo, from an ICRC perspective and, and perhaps through a data protection lens, but I leave that to you, what's one challenge or opportunity that you're really planning around as we head into next year. Well, thank you, Stuart. I think there I'm uh, going to follow on Nayana's example and identify something that is both an opportunity and a challenge and, uh, and a massive opportunity and a massive challenge. In fact, uh, as we're looking at, uh, we just discussed about how now what is new is that we have that awareness and we have those tools that are available to us. We have a new way or a way to actually responsibly deploy technology. And, uh, and now I think the major challenge and an opportunity at the same time is actually to ensure that it doesn't, uh, or this, this, this guidance and the guidance tools do not stay on a shelf and they actually get applied concretely in our day-to-day -day work that become a part of our culture, a, 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 culture, a culture change was mentioned earlier, that become part of our day-to-day -day work and part of the, uh, the, 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 the regular uh, reflexes in deploying or analyzing technology. So I think the, the challenge and the opportunity that we have um, is, is really to leverage this positive ecosystem that has been created over the last couple of years, over the last few years, uh, with all the work that uh, the, the center has done, all the work that we all did together um, uh, around the, the, the guidance, the principles, the handbook, uh, to take it a step further and, uh, and give the tools to concretely apply. We have, as you know, uh, been discussing um, with the Humanitarian Data and Trust Initiative in the framework of the Humanitarian Data and Trust Initiative, ways of really making it happen together with you at the Center of Humanitarian Data and all the colleagues from the humanitarian sector that have been involved so far in our discussions. And um, indeed, really, the, the, the way that we have identified to make it happen is organized around three key pillars. The first pillar being one around policy and dialogue. We need, as a sector, to be able to always capture the emerging trends and the emerging challenges that are coming up, share experience and find together with a multi-stakeholder approach, bringing together all the relevant types of expertise, uh, technology specialists and uh, computer science uh, in academia and data protection authorities and privacy commissioners and humanitarian actors and companies that are working around those technologies to identify what challenges are emerging and what they mean specifically for the humanitarian sector to provide 
up-to-date and punctual and specific uh, guidance. So we heard, for example, about the Wilton Park Initiative earlier around the relationship between uh, donor uh, countries and humanitarian organizations and how uh, we can ensure responsible reporting to donors. And uh, um, soon, as you know very well, Stuart, we will be launching the the digital humanitarian forum or a digitarium uh, as a one-year initiative that will uh, look into specific aspects and emerging challenges in humanitarian action, starting from um, this new world in which we find ourselves that is increasingly digital, where uh, elements like digital contact tracing and uh, uh, we're now talking about vaccination passports or immunity passports or all sorts of new passports, uh, how those could be impacting in positive and negative ways and how we can navigate those challenges. So that's that's uh, the first one around policy and guidance. Secondly, research and development. We have identified a number of cases in which with proper guidance, we can tackle uh, the challenges that are brought up by the, the responsible deployment of technologies. There are some where this is not possible. The technology as it is does not actually respond to the needs of the humanitarian sector. And that's where research and development and working with academia and industrial partners may be fundamental. Uh, so we're talking now, um, you, might have see, you might have seen uh, last week, we announced um, a partnership with the Lausanne Polytechnic University and the Zurich Polytechnic University uh, with uh, eight projects that are really designed to uh, tailor the technology to the specific humanitarian needs. Um, we'll be closely working, for example, on the responsible use or uh, application of cutting edge research in uh, encryption on the responsible use of biometric data, for example. But there's a number of initiatives that we could actually engage in and mutualize as a sector. Uh, so this is the second pillar. And the third and last pillar um, would be around learning and, uh, and education. Uh, with research and development and with the development of tools that are privacy by design, we are giving in the hands of our colleagues tools that will be respectful of data protection uh, rights and, 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 and uh, principles. But we still need to make sure that, our, that everybody who is handling data, as has been mentioned earlier, has the tools to apply this guide. And so uh, again, uh, we will be developing with the University of Maastricht a training and certification course for data protection officers in humanitarian action. We're working around courses on technology for non-specialists, for humanitarian managers and advisors, because as has been said earlier, we, our managers and our advisors are advising on taking decisions that have very significant implications for affected populations. And the impact of us ch choosing one type of cloud over another uh, is very significant. So we need to understand what those different um, nuances of technology are. Great, Massimo, thanks so much. There are certainly a number of opportunities there that we can build on uh, together and with this network of partners that's here today. So I think we'll go right into the q and I'm trying to keep track of the, the upvoting, but things keep moving around. So I think we'll build on what Massimo is just saying and first go to the question from Rory Crew about data skills and how data skills are being developed um, with uh, quote unquote, program colleagues or at the program level. And Shannon, I think building on what you said in the last round, I'd like to come first to you and just hear your thoughts on maybe what has been useful for you as a coordination specialist to feel more comfortable with data and understand the issues around data. And then Nina, as a data provider in many ways, but also someone who manages a team of mixed specialties, I'd like you to also answer this same question. So over to Shannon and then Nina, and then we'll move on to the next question. Thanks, Stuart. I think um, in terms of, of data skills and data processing capacity for, for program staff, I would focus more on data skills and less on the processing capacity. It's more an issue of data awareness and knowledge and how you interpret the data and understand it, um, especially for staff at a, at a program level to understand the implications of the analysis and how you use it to inform your programming and less about, uh, let's say, number crunching, uh, so to speak. So uh, back over to you, Stuart, thanks. Great, thanks. And Nina, as, as someone who manages a team of people who do a lot of that processing, what other thoughts do you have on this, on this question? 
I think the just uh, Shannon's already covered what I was going to say, but to add to that, one thing is specifically to to distinguish a bit between between the the technical skills in terms of what what needs to be done, but the the principles behind what needs to be done. So if you look at something like SDC, which is which is a tool on on R, somebody who I have a lot of people on my team who don't know who don't work with R, who don't know how to use R, but then they still need to understand what is the principle behind the requirements of the SDC tool, what needs to be done in terms of preparing data set, preparing, um, processing your data, deleting specific types of data before you publish, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this, this distinction between, and not being scared, I think the word data scares a lot of people, just um, you know, um, that means that you are a data scientist, but uh, it doesn't need to be, as long as you're familiar with the principles and and uh, yeah, willing to just engage with the data in, in an interpretive way. I think that's that's what it needs. That's all. Brilliant, Nina, thanks. And, and we, perhaps one of my colleagues can drop a link into the chat, but we've been developing materials with REACH and others around statistical disclosure control and similar methods and recently released a series of videos in which I, not a data person, talk about some advanced methods that I was able to learn. So if I can do it, anybody can. Um, Irina, I'd like to come to you with the next question from Siobhan here about thoughts on how to measure how responsible we're being. So this is something, of course, that's come up in the discussions around the IASC operational guidance. Once we have this operational guidance in place, how do we keep track of our progress? So over to you for some thoughts on sort of generally monitoring um, how we're doing in this area. Thank you, thank you. It's a very interesting question. In fact, I had to think about this. Um, how do we measure? I think the first step is almost there. First of all, we've agreed on what is data responsibility. And once we agree, I think the, the measurement will come out of the definition. And let me anchor myself into the, the three descriptive of the definition, um, safe, ethical, and effective. And again, I would, I would go back uh, to uh, talking about the, um, uh, aligning ourselves with established frameworks, what standards do we have? How do we measure those standards? So do we have standards in place and how do we measure ourselves? Um, how do we share data? Are we sharing data? How do we share data? Do we follow our protocols that we've established to sh uh, share data? Um, of course, a lot has been said about, about data security. Um, um, looking at the cybersecurity dimension that also needs to be part of the of developing those measurement, should I use the word measurement indicators? Probably that's that's one uh, that's another step that we'll have to uh, to consider. Um, but furthermore, talking about data responsibility, um, I I would like to maybe add something else here is to talk about effectiveness. So when we are we when we are approaching uh, data activities um, in a responsible manner, as we we are committing ourselves, how effective are in that? How, are the beneficiaries, our persons of concern, better protected? Do they um, receive assistance that they are in need of? Can we find solutions? So in the end, we need to meet these overall objectives. Um, I hope I've answered the question. Absolutely, Irina. I think that gives us all a lot to think about as we continue to professionalize the way we do this work. We have to keep track of our progress, what's working, what's not, and those pesky lessons that we need to learn and not leave on the table. There are two questions that I'd like to pose to Massimo um, and I'll read them out briefly and then hand over to you Massimo. So the first relates to operating in challenging environments and some of the restrictions on um, financial regulation that affect particularly cash and voucher assistance. And the question specifically is whether technologies such as blockchain or cryptocurrency could increase trust of financial institutions toward the humanitarian sector. So I'll ask you to answer that one briefly, but then also since it's quite targeted toward ICRC, maybe speak on this question about whether uh, the GDPR has affected or influenced the humanitarian sector and specifically how we think about data protection. So Massimo, over to you for a brief reply to those two points. Thank you, Stuart, and uh, thanks uh, to the colleagues that asked these questions. They're really uh, interesting questions and uh, very topical. Um, the issue of, uh, yes, uh, sanctions and restrictions on uh, uh, flows of uh, funding and, uh, and resources is definitely one that is high on the, uh, on the agenda and the concerns of, in the humanitarian sector. Now, uh, 
the, the, the question really requires a, a thorough anal analysis of where the problem lies. And uh, there is the tendency to always look for a solution in the technology, uh, but perhaps it's really, um, the, the first point would be to look at where exactly the problem lies. And this is an area in which we are indeed um, looking and we are looking at whether distributed ledger technology can somehow help, most likely wouldn't be in the form of cryptocurrencies because there remain currencies. And so similar restrictions to the circulation of currencies would remain. Um, but where uh, the mention is made about uh, concerns around the trust for the humanitarian sector, I think it's also important to, to, to stress that sometimes we create problems where there may not be. It's true that there may be problems that are on trust, but this is not a problem that we face directly. It's not like we need to find a, a, a blockchain solution because people do not trust us or do not trust OCHA. There may be situations where there are um, uh, concerns around um, uh, allocation of resources and those it could perhaps be interested, interesting to look at distributed ledger technology from the point of view of traceability and accountability. Most likely wouldn't be in the form of a cryptocurrency, but it's a really uh, big um, topic and, uh, and difficult to answer it in a, in a minute. On the second one, um, the GDPR and um, having, having influenced the, um, uh, the, the, the humanitarian sector's approach to data protection as a, as a joke, and I stress, as a joke, I would say that perhaps it were it was the handbook that influenced the GDPR since it was published before. Obviously, it's a joke. The the, the discussions on the GDPR have been ongoing for a long time, and they did indeed influence um, some of the thinking um, around data protection in the humanitarian sector. This is uh, somehow normal. That uh, first of all, I wouldn't say it's the GDPR. The GDPR is a reflection within the European Union of much wider, wi more widely accepted uh, rights uh, within the Council of Europe and beyond because they're based on the Council of Europe Convention 108, which is open for accession uh, to countries that are outside of the Council of Europe. And it already includes a significant number of countries and an increasing number of countries uh, outside of the Council of Europe zone. And um, this is not surprising because it reflects a common and shared view as to what response may be relevant to the increasing challenges that are arising from digitalization and, and digital technologies. So yes, there has been an influence, but it's one that it, it makes sense. And it's probably uh, it, 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 the, the fact that it's a meaningful one and one that makes sense can also be seen in the fact that um, as an organization that has been working for over 150 years, we have lots of policies and guidelines that have been developed over time. And we, if we look at the guidance that we had before in our protection work, it already included very um, uh, similar concepts and notions around transparency, accountability, uh, informed consent, uh, data retention, security, all concepts that are just developed further uh, in the uh, in the more more recent and modern uh, frameworks of of data, um, data protection regulation. Massimo, thanks so much, and and thanks for trying to tackle two very difficult questions so quickly. We are surprisingly already out of time. We have a long list of questions still to answer, so we'll see what we can do in terms of going through those, making sure that we capture and address them perhaps in a blog post in early 2021. As you can hear, my dog is particularly excited about doing that. And what I'd just like to do is quickly go around for our panelists and invite you to each make one New Year's resolution related to how you and your organization can help advance data responsibility moving forward. I will start to give you 10 seconds to think about it. So for me and my team, our commitment is to say more with less. We will write shorter, more concise guidance. We will provide more concrete and actionable advice. And we will do our part to make sure that you don't have to read through, as we're often reminded, hundreds of pages of policies and guidance to understand what data responsibility means in practice. So I'm just going to follow the order on my screen and Massimo go to you, then Shannon, Irina, and Nina. Massimo. Thank you. 
Uh, I think, yes, thank you, Stuart. Uh, yes, we will also not uh, produce another 312 page long document, but we will focus on enabling the application of this across the sector through, as I mentioned, policy and dialogue with um, policy and dialogue, uh, research and development and learning and education opportunities together with you and with all the partners that, have, uh, that are on this panel today and that are willing to work with us. Uh, the donor countries that are co-convening with us the humanitarian uh, data and trust initiative like Switzerland, uh, the ones that have been uh, promoting data responsibility um, like ECHO, Luxembourg, and a number of others that are willing to join. Great, Shannon. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so I have to caveat this by saying that I cannot keep my own personal New Year's resolutions, but I will give this a go. Uh, so next year, uh, we will work harder to ensure continued collaboration amongst the teams in the Yemen office to support data responsibility because this is everyone's job. And I hope we can reconvene around the same time next year to check in and see where we stand with all of our, our promises. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. Brilliant. Thank you. Irina. Thank you. I would probably go back to what Stuart you said at the beginning. We have lessons. So one of the one of the uh, commitments is to make sure that these lessons are learned and they're learned uh, coming out of COVID. Um, the vaccine is almost there. So we need to remember that moving everything online means also excluding those who don't have access to internet and online and digital platforms. So one of our responsibilities, data responsibilities, is to include and that's the, that's the resolution, over. Excellent, and Naina, over to you. Um, I think mine would be a bit of a personal and professional, make me sound a bit of a nerd, but I would love to learn and become an expert in one innovative uh, remote data collection technology and then professionally bring that into, into the work we do with uh, impact, but in a responsible way. Not ambitious at all. I think it's telling that everyone's resolutions have to do with learning, collaborating, and communicating more effectively about data responsibility. We can take up that challenge together, and I really appreciate everyone's interest and commitment to doing so. Massimo, Shannon, Irina, and Nina, thank you for your expertise and for sharing your reflections on this complex topic. We really also appreciate the over 200 people who joined us today for this discussion on a late evening in late December after what has been, by all accounts, a very difficult year. We wish everybody a safe and healthy end of the year, and we look forward to continuing this conversation as we move into 2021 and move farther toward implementing data responsibility in practice. Thank you all and take care. <laughs>